Welcome to the Lessons from the Great Coaches podcast. I've learned that you don't do it alone. You learn so many different things from so many different coaches. That's an elite learning environment. Failure is not a problem. How you deal with it is a problem. How to be resilient. How important it is to infuse joy in the process of learning. To be a good coach, you've got to give more than you take. What an interesting life it is to be a leader. Hello and welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast, where we believe that there is no algorithm for leadership, and so we interview great sports coaches from around the world to try and find ideas to help all of us be better leaders. Today's episode is on the topic of people skills, and we're joined for the discussion by Alistair McCaw. Alistair is that rare person who excels across disciplines and industries. In addition to being an author who has sold over 300,000 books, his podcast ranks in the top 1% of the world, and for the last 25 years he has consulted and worked with Olympic gold medal teams, Grand Slam champions, Fortune 500 companies, NCAA colleges and professional sports teams all around the world. And today you will hear him mention many of these teams in this terrific interview. Some of the highlights from our discussion are the importance of self and social awareness when it comes to developing your people skills. How likability is your best ability as a leader when it comes to getting the best out of people. And how thriving teams have a strong sense of connection that is created by the leader through careful people selection. And just before we go to the interview, if you like what we do here on the podcast, then head over to our website, thegreatcoachespodcast.com. There you will find loads of unreleased audio and video content that you can download and share with your friends, family and colleagues to bring a different perspective to the challenges that you might be facing. And now, please enjoy our interview with Alistair McCall. You're listening to the Lessons from the Great Coaches Podcast. Alistair McCaw, it's great to see you again. Where are you in the world and what have you been up to so far today? Uh, same as last time. I'm, I'm at home here in Florida. Uh, been busy trying to get book number seven finished uh, before the end of the year. That's always a, a, a challenge, to, especially the last parts of, of getting a book ready. Um, I'm sure there's a few listeners out there who've maybe had the experience uh, the easy part is actually writing the book. The difficult part is getting it published and getting it uh, edited and out there. So uh, that's what I've been. Uh, that's what I've been up to. Well, we're going to continue our discussion on leadership themes connected to your writing and your work with sporting organisations all over the world. And the theme this time is people skills, which, as we'll. I guess unearth through this conversation is very, very important, and some say more important than strategy. But I want to start, uh, Alistair, by asking you: What do you think people with good people skills do differently? Well, this is something that I really had to work on, um, especially from a, from a young age. I was, you know, my background was in individual sports and running and triathlon and so on. So I was always uh a loner so to say i wasn't really involved in teams after after school so i'd say my social skills got worse and worse over the years spending lots of time on the road by myself but if there's something i've seen in in what makes good people skills is that people generally love being around other people they they enjoy the company and this is something that has has struck me observing some of the best coaches best leaders best managers in the world is that they really enjoy being around others. They're social people, so to say, but that isn't to say that you can't have good people skills um, because I'm I'm an example of that as, as well, where I had to really work on it more. Um, but something also that, that comes to my mind is, is, you know, being more interested in others than trying to be interesting. And what does that mean? Is that um, I'm genuinely interested in finding out more about you and getting to know you. And that's something that the great coaches and leaders do as well. Uh, instead of trying to be interesting and tr- instead of me trying to show you what I can do and who I am, I'm more interested in you. And I apologize uh, 
for anyone who's listened to maybe uh, one or two of our episodes here on the Great Coaches Podcast, I always mention Coach K. And it's something that that really struck me about him, Coach K, of course, of, of uh, Duke basketball. And he was the USA basketball Olympic coach, uh, gold medal winning coach. But, you know, my conversations with him is that he was always deeply interested in you. He would always ask a lot of questions. And, you know, I was the one that wanted to ask him, him more questions, of course. But, um, you know, great, great leaders, great coaches. They're more interested in others than trying to be interesting themselves. And then... One more thing is that they really make other people feel special. They, when you walk out, when I used to walk out of that office, I felt like somebody. Always felt important in a way, and I find that's what that's that's what they do as well. People with good people skills is they make you feel valued. They make you feel special. Well, you mentioned listening in there, but if I was to ask you to sort of unpack the key parts or the individual components of people skills. What kind of things would you list out? Definitely awareness, um, self-awareness and social awareness. So how I behave. So my, my self-awareness would be how I behave, how I interact, how I communicate. That's important to know, first of all. Um, and then, of course, the social awareness is being more aware of others, of where they're at, uh, how they're feeling, how they interact. And, you know, we can go deeper and deeper into this with regards to understanding other people's cultures differently and um, their backgrounds, for example. So to be to have good people skills, it's all about understanding, understanding of yourself and understanding of others. And then, of course, empathy comes to mind as well of, of having compassion and empathy. And this is something which I really am excited about the more and more we go with leadership, because looking back to when you know, I was brought up, um, you know, growing up in South Africa, for example, it was a very much an autocratic style of leadership. Do as I say, you would get shouted at in 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 practice. Uh, you know, the way of coaching back back then was 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 screaming and and yelling and getting reprimanded and so on and so forth. And we see that these days that just doesn't work anymore. For example, so today's leader and today's coach is more imp- empathetic. They have more compassion. They have better self-awareness. They have better social awareness. Um, so those are those are some of the things that, that I find are, are key parts of, of uh, people skills. No, I mean, to that end, Alistair, we had uh, Nick Montgomery uh, on recently. And Nick is a great underdog story of his uh, championship winning team here in Australia. And he's now, he's gone off to Hibs in the Scottish League. And he's, I don't even think Nick's 40 yet. So he's got a long career ahead of him as a coach. But when he was reflecting, on the great coaches he'd worked with himself, he was a professional player. He said that man management was the word he used to describe it, which I think is another way of talking about people skills. And I'll insert Nick uh, talking about exactly what you were just mentioning uh, here. I should probably say the word man management, if that's one word or, or two words, but I just think the way that people manage um, the staff, the players, the the group as a whole, uh, I think that's po- probably the most important aspects of of the successful leaders and coaches in, in any sport and that's something that I, I really try hard over the years to to learn from you know, the, the good ones that I worked with and you mentioned a few then um, as well as you know I've been fortunate to to, to spend time with Mike Phelan and, and people of that caliber so yeah it's just amazing you know to, to share experiences and to, to yeah to learn from people like that. So Alistair you you talk a lot about habits. It's it's one of the things in your book that really resonates with me. Small things you can do every day that make a difference to your overall performance. Um, and I'm wondering, when you reflect on some of these people you've interacted with that have got great people skills, what is it that they do in this habit space? Is there anything that you've seen that they do differently, continually, that helps them improve in this area? Well, I think, you know, in, in leadership and in coaching, respect is very important, uh, first of all. But um, I, I believe that likability is your best ability in coaching. Um, you know, player, you speak to players and teams or even, even you know, teams in, in the corporate world, they will work harder and they will push further for a coach or a leader that they like. 
Um, respect, of course, is important, but likability is important as well as that. You've got to you've got to enjoy somebody's company. You've got to like them. If we just look at, for example, of Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool, how he's assembled a group of players that play for him. Um, you can just, you know, I I follow a lot of their inside training and and monitor a lot of their 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 off the field work as well. And you can just see there's a group that just really love enjoy being together. And that's something I've seen in successful teams, uh, corporate or in sports, is that they just really, you know, and that's what a good culture is as well, is that you really enjoy going there. You love to be around other people. And, um, you know, that, that's important. So likability is uh, is an important habit. Um, one of the other things I've seen in great leaders and great coaches is how they prepare as well. Um they're very adaptable. Uh, you know, they're able to to change to change course very quickly as well. They they're they're solution finders. They're not stuck on the problem too long. Uh, these are these are habits that they've built over time as well. Um, they might not get all the decisions right all the time, but they definitely can make a decision. So you know, uh, being decisive is important in it as well. Um, also, just you know, you know, they say that you know, first impressions last as well. It's just when you meet. Uh, when you meet these kind of people as well, you really feel a warmth um, t- towards them as well. They're, you know, getting back to our, one of our first points as well is that they're really interested in you. I, I'll keep going back to that as well um, by getting to know you, asking a lot of questions, and you know that only makes another person feel feel good about themselves, feel special about themselves. So, um, another thing I think which is important as well is that they see the good in others. They see that you know they they're not. I, the old style of leadership, the autocratic style of leadership was always critical. It was always finding what you did wrong and being reprimanded and so on and so forth. As where today's leader is uh, provides feedback in, in a different way uh, with more compassion, more empathy, as we spoke about. But they also they also look for the good more. And we know that appreciation and uh, positive feedback is the best form of motivation there is in in coaching and leadership. So these are some of the things I've I've observed and seen around some of the best the best teams, the best corporates. If I just think, for example, with my visits to Brentford uh, Football Club in London as well, uh, with with Thomas Frank, which uh, who I know uh, that you've interviewed. In fact, it's one of my my most favorite interviews of yours. Uh, I think it was actually probably the very first episode I, I listened to you of Paul was uh, was with Thomas Frank. And when you walk into the building there, you just feel uh, a great culture. Um, You wouldn't know who the leader is there. You wouldn't know who the main person is there. Everybody, uh, you know, is just, is just part of one big family and, and, and one great culture. And yeah, that's, you know, just observing those type of leaders like, like Thomas Frank and, and Jurgen Klopp and coach K um, they, they, the, the players love them. They, they, you know, they, they, that's why they play hard for them every week. One of the things I've noticed is, particularly in the great coaches I've interviewed, is something that you just did then, which is they mention your name. And yeah. I remember interviewing very early on a, a gentleman called Damien McGrath. He's a rugby sevens coach. And he was interesting because Damien's brother is also a great coach. He coaches cricket. And he, uh, he won the, um, the county championship in the UK. But Damien tells this great story about Graham Murray, the Australian rugby league coach, coming over to England and how before he arrived, he got a list of everybody's name in the club and their partner's names, and he memorised it in day one. And I just thought, what a great way to, to as you just say then, to cue into that likability factor when when someone remembers your name. It's such a powerful uh, idea. I'll insert that that clip here so you can hear this, uh, this story about Graham Murray from Damien. The man I regard as... The greatest coach, and that's Graham Murray, an Australian. So Leeds employed Graham Murray, who had a big success around the NRL clubs in Australia. And I didn't know what to expect. I'd never met him, and I received a phone call from him. And we're going back to the 90s now, before emails and such like were really the accepted form of of how to do things. And we talked for for half an hour on the phone, and he gave me a list of things he'd like me to do. And one of them was, could I get a list of names of all the staff and players and put it in a letter or a fax, I think it was a fax, and, and also get a name of their wives, husband or partners and, and send that across. 
So I did that. To, you know, um, Leeds was a was a big organisation, much akin to a soccer club. It, it, a commercial department, and finally was it ran the cricket stadium as well. So it was a big thing. So I did that and sent it over to Graham. When he arrived, we went to pick him up from the airport and came in. And he was laughing, he, he, always laughing, always. And he reminded me of Paul Daly that his enthusiasm was easy to see. And but he he made me feel as though I'd known him for years, which was a skill in itself. We went into the main office and he came across and people stood up to come to meet him as, as the chief exec took him round. And he went over to Julian, the shop, who was the head of the Leeds Rhino shop there. And Gary Hetherington, the chief exec, said, oh, Graham, this is uh, Julie. She's the, Julie, how are you? How's Paul? Well, you could see, you know, shoulders went back and oh, he knows me. He knows who I am. How is he? You know, he did that with about four or five different people at different times in the next hour through and it was an old circus trick, I suppose, you know, a bit of a memory thing. But just by showing an interest in people and those, everybody in different parts of the organisation thought, he knows me and he knows something about me. And even within that first hour, he had people in the palm of his hand. And I thought, what, what an amazing thing to do. Well, that was, you know, that was something that, that Sir Alex Ferguson used to do as well. Now, his style of leadership... Um, it's very interesting. You know, one of my questions is, would Sir Alex Ferguson's style of leadership work today? And it's incredible how many different answers and opinions you get on that as well. Um, of course, you know, he was incredibly successful at Manchester United for 27 years and coached four generations of, 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 of players. Um, you know, he was a, he was a master at, at being able to adapt to situations, but, you know, always held his values firm and his standards were always very high and, and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, he made sure everybody knew um, the names of, of every single person at Carrington at their training ground, family names. They, you know, speaking to Phil Neville, uh, who played for Manchester United, he said that Sir Alex remembered everybody's names, everybody's partner's names, their kids' He just said it was just an incredible, uh, incredible trait that he that he had. What do you think the difference is when, so you've developed these people skills, and you've arrived in a team, but what difference do those skills make in a thriving team? How is that difference visible? You know, I if I look here in Florida, for example, there's there's a university right right. Um, right down the road from me called Florida Atlantic University. And there's a coach there called Ricky Gonzalez, who's been there, I think, for probably about eight, 10 years now. And he reminds me a little bit of what Jurgen Klopp has done with Liverpool with a limited budget, um, but just getting a great team together of players that were maybe overlooked from other other colleges, other universities, for example. And, you know, every time I, I would visit you know, their practice, I would sometimes just stop by there. It's, you know, it's down here in Boca Raton. Um, there was always so much, always so much fun and laughter at the practice sessions. Um, but there was hard work. There was serious hard work. And this is something I also see with Jurgen Klopp in Liverpool is that when I watch their practices and when I watch their, you know, their gym sessions, there's just almost, so, there's always so much laughter and fun and camaraderie going on. And that, you know, for me, those are winning teams. Um, so those are, those are what I find in the thriving team is again, they, they love to be around each other. They love to, 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 they look forward to seeing each other. I mean, it must be the most incredible feeling is that you go to work and you can't wait to see your colleagues. I mean, wouldn't that just be the perfect, perfect world? And, and these teams have that, and these leaders and these coaches are able to create that environment. Um, they're very careful of who they they select for the team uh, in terms of not just skill, but just will these players get along with my players I have right now? So they understand those dynamics better. They're not just looking at stats and goals and shots and assists and so on and so forth. They're looking at personality more than anything. Um, I think in, in, in my book, um, Becoming a Great Team Player, I talk about that, that winning teams are teams that are having fun. And that's, and, and, you know, it's like the chicken and the egg theory. Well, do you have to start winning to have fun or should you have fun first before you start to win? And it's important that the, 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 the result is taken out of it and, and more the process of enjoying 
going to work every day, if that's what you can call it for, for something that you love to do, like sports, for example, but it just, they, thriving, thriving cultures is where there's, there's, there's laughter, there's, there's fun, there's enjoyment um, in, in, in the process. Well, it's fascinating listening to you because I think I'm starting to form this, this idea that there's a link, particularly from the people I interview around this idea of fun empowering learning there there is a connection there that is that is very powerful and i even see it with my own children if they're having fun in the classroom if they're mm. enjoying that environment their ability to learn and recall goes up and i think there is great coaches are able to tap into this i know steve kerr talks about about joy uh, which i guess is a subset of, of fun but equally i remember talk when we interviewed justin langer he said you know camaraderie is the glue that keeps teams together and I thought that was such a powerful idea, but it also empowers his people skills. I think it's probably a, a double-edged yep. sword. Absolutely. Alistair, was there a, a an event, a moment, was there someone you met, a, a project you were on, where you suddenly started to see the value of people skills amongst the many other competencies that, that leaders, leaders in sport, leaders in the corporate world need to have? Yeah, I would, you know, there's two examples I'd go back to. I worked, I had the pleasure to work with Graham Smith, the South African uh, cricket captain in South Africa when Graham was 18. And he was just breaking through. Of course, he was a very good junior cricketer as well. He played for South African schools and he played for the South African um, Protea uh, team as well, under 18s. And already then I could tell his, uh, you know, see his leadership skills already back then that he was going to be a fantastic leader, which of course he kept in South Africa for a long time as well. But just seeing it already at, at that age of how he would deal with people and how he would um, stay calm under, under pressure and under, under adversity was, was very impressive. Um, so that was, that was one example. Another example was Carlos Quiros who has coached uh, the Portugal national uh, football soccer team, football team, wherever you are in the world right now. Uh, he was Alex Ferguson's number one as well when Ronaldo was at Manchester United. And I got to meet Carlos uh, when he was coaching the South African national team. And this was probably back in, gosh, late 90s. And I remember I remember being in, in the hotel with the players and Carlos came in. And just getting back to one of our previous topics was names. And Carlos came into the hotel. Now, the, now the team would usually stay at the hotel. It was the Intercontinental in in um, in Santon in, in Johannesburg. And what you know, back then maybe I didn't understand leadership as much. But what I remember most is that he remembered everybody's names: the receptionists, um, the workers, the the janitors. Um, he would go into the back kitchen where he had, he had greet everybody. And of course, um, you know, being the national soccer uh, manager, he was an icon. I mean, you'd hear them scream loudly and cheer when you'd go into the kitchen at, at the hotel, but just those skills, you know, he could have been someone that felt he was important, that he would get his room. He would get his key for his room and go straight up to his room because he was super busy. But that was something that really spoke to me about now that is leadership. Um, and you can you could tell that that hotel was just would do anything for that team would do anything for him to make make help them win for example so that was for me a genius um, also just the way he was with players as well uh, you know he was a big big part of Ronaldo coming to uh, Manchester United and of course that was a that was a genius of Sir Alex to bring a, a, a Portuguese coach in. Uh, when he wanted to bring Ronaldo in, because obviously Carlos knew him. So yeah, those were two examples of of um, of things that really jumped out to me. So Alistair, we've talked about being calm, we've talked about laughter, we've talked about names, we've talked about likability. But if I was to put you on the spot and say, right, one thing we can all do tomorrow to start improving our people skills, what would you recommend? I would say be more self-aware of um of your conversations of your interactions of your behaviors how you deal with with people i think that would be the first thing so uh self-reflect is is a great exercise especially at the end of the day or 
whenever you might feel and and you know journal write down some things of how you how you felt you did that day with with conversations um self-awareness is, is a massive one in in terms of improving yourself uh, you know, I always say that, you know, how do you become a more positive person, for example, is that you're aware of when you're being negative. That's one of the first steps. And you're able to stop that quickly in its tracks. You know, positive people still get negative. But the difference is, is that positive people are more aware of it and can change that quicker. So self-awareness is, is, a, is a massive one in, in leadership um, for me. I know journaling is something you always talk about. And I think... <laughs> at least 30 percent of the coaches we've interviewed all talk about journaling as well i think it's a, a common practice to, against all people that are in those type of high pressure leadership environments but what about the trigger points alistair what have you noticed about the trigger points when people lose sight of the importance of people skills and of course coming to mind and is all those coaches throwing things on the sideline and yelling and screaming which always gives me a little bit of a chuckle but what are the trigger points that people should be aware of where you focus on people skills drops yeah i would say definitely pressure when pressure comes around how you you're able to react i think that's a massive one as well the, the great leaders the great coaches are able to stay calm they're able to um step back and 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 analyze it a little bit better than make ra rational decisions so definitely uh pressure can can change somebody as well um also uh power as well and, and being in a, in a position of power can also uh become problematic as well where you know like i just said you know someone like carlos queros can have the choice of being a very important person which he is um and and you know get his key and go up to his room and not want to to be bothered with anyone but you know he cho chose to have uh a, a different style of leadership of being a people's person so you know for me uh when we talk about people skills carlos definitely always come comes to my mind and then the third one i'd say would be how they deal with problems um you know do they blame do they complain do they point fingers or do they take responsibility you know i'm sure you've heard that you know, great coaches, uh, uh, great coaches are able to endorse and uh, share the the accolades with the team when they win, but also but take responsibility when they lose, as well, which is not always an, an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, especially in today's world of sports. And if we look at Premiership soccer, um, I think that that last season had the highest amount of of coaches getting getting fired or getting sacked. I think it was incredible. It was, I think it was something like 13 or 14 coaches in one calendar season. Uh, that That's insane. Um, you know, so, yeah, I, I would say it's those three things is how they deal with pressure, uh, how they deal with problems, and, and of course, how they deal with power of being in that position. Do they do they take advantage of it? Um, those are three, three trigger points, I believe, that can change uh, a leader. I think this idea of power is a fascinating one. I know in the uh, the book, I think it's is it Doris Kearns, I may have got her name slightly wrong, A Team of Rivals, where she talks about Abraham Lincoln's presidency. And she talks about the fact that he would have a public opinion bath every week. And I thought it was such a great idea of just staying humble and being grounded by listening to, to people's everyday concerns at the same time you're trying to run a Yeah, Ab so Abraham Lincoln, he used to have he used to have a 4 p.m. um uh, where he would have, you know, a few of his councilmen come into the come into the office and they'd have a, a scotch or a, a brandy or whatever and they would sit around and talk about about these type of things as well so there, there you have it you know we're, we're great leaders are able to share uh you know share with others as well instead of you know always trying to make the decision themselves so yeah alistair one final question if i could and it's one of the things i love about um your writing, actually, in both the books and in social media, is your ability to frame questions. And I've talked about this before when I've interviewed you. And I would like to finish by just asking you, are there any questions that we could be asking ourselves on as we reflect on our own approach to people's skills? I think one of the most important questions is, how do I want to be seen as a leader? How do I want to be perceived as a leader? Um, another one is, is, am I approachable as a leader? These are, I think those are two important questions. So how do I want to be perceived as a leader? So again, that will, that will, you know, we've spoken a lot on, 
about self-awareness and and am I approachable? And there's a very simple exercise I I do with leaders sometimes is I ask them and you know I, listeners if you if you want to do this if you got a pen and paper it's something I do when I listen to podcasts I always sit with a pen and paper and take down notes and I've got pages of your your uh, of, of from your podcast of of your guests Paul um, but is write down three to five keywords of how you would like to be seen as a leader so those keywords could be um compassionate they could be uh, a good listener um all these things but how would you like to be seen so take three to five key words write those down and that's a great way to self-reflect at the end of the day for example if you're working if that's how you want to be perceived is how did i do how did i do here how did i do here for example so you know that's a that's a great way to improve your leadership fantastic idea alistair as always it's great talking to you. I look forward to reading the next book um, and going uh, going deep with you on yet another topic connected to leadership. So thank you again for, for joining us, Alistair. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me, Paul. Hi, everyone. You have been listening to Alistair McCaw talk about people skills. I hope you got a lot out of his style, ideas and insights and found a few things that you can bring back to your own dinner table, locker room, or workroom table for discussion. And just before we go, if you have any feedback, then please let us know. Just like Matt Embling, who said, Paul, just wanted to reach out and say thank you for creating this podcast. I really enjoy listening to the podcasts in the train, travelling to work, or home, or even heading off to training with the boys. Thanks, Matt. We appreciate you taking the time to get back to us. In fact, we love the interaction with the people around the world who listen. It keeps us going. And so if you have any feedback or comments, please let us know. And if they're positive ones, then let your friends and family know too. All the details on how to connect with us are in the show notes or on our website, thegreatcoachespodcast.com.